Neurodiversity, neurodivergent, neurotypical. You might have heard of these words here and there, but what do they mean and how do they connect with each other? What is neurodiversity? The word itself means that people can be neurologically different and that is a-okay. It signifies that some brains are wired differently and that these differences are normal and do not represent deficits. The neurodiverse movement is a movement that establishes the idea that there is no normal way for how a brain should be. It means that if you have autism or ADHD or OCD or dyslexia or literally any learning difference, it does not make your brain abnormal, but that these conditions are just variations of the human brain. When in the late 1990s, Judy Singer, a sociologist who herself was on the autism spectrum, came up with this word, neurodiversity, her hope was to shift the focus from deficits and disorder to normalizing neurological differences. Now, neurodivergent is a person who has neurological variations. The opposite of this would be neurotypical, which is a person who has no neurological variation. But oh my goodness, that was so many terminology in the beginning of the talk. Let's relax, take a step back, and maybe play a game together. Let's play two truths and one lie. And if you don't know this game, it's where I say three statements, two are true and one is a lie, and you have to guess which one the lie is. So let's go. Statement one, approximately 40% of students in Canada are identified as exceptional by an identification that is placed under the learning disabilities category. This includes neurodivergent individuals. Statement two, even though there are approximately 935,000 adults and 30,000 children in Canada reported to have a learning condition, there is three times higher dropout rates for these students and 30% higher unemployment rates. And finally, life has been extremely predictable during this pandemic. Any guesses to where the lie is here? Because I hope you guessed the last one. The first two are definitely true and I hope shocking. Because even though it clearly shows that our society is made of different types of learners and neurodiversities, the system has still not adapted to fit the needs and wants of many diverse populations. My name is Bahar Musabi and I'm here today to talk about neurodiversity. There are many reasons why there are such shocking stats when it comes to education dropout rates, unemployment rates, and poverty rates in neurodiverse populations. There are many reasons, but some include ableistic approaches of our society, lack of public awareness, and limited resources to support neurodivergent individuals all the way from school to employment. But let's dive into them further. What is ableism? Ableism is a discrimination or prejudice against people with disabilities. It's the idea that the society should be created for a person without any diverse needs, and it is the responsibility of people with diverse needs to fit themselves in the society. It's like building a 14-story building and only putting stairs in it. No elevator, no escalator, no nothing to accommodate for people who can't climb those stairs. Now, there might be many reasons why someone is unable to climb those stairs, but nonetheless, you assume that it was their responsibility to figure out a way to get to the top. Now, over the years, more and more people climb those stairs and get to the top and enjoy the beautiful views all the while leaving a minority behind thinking that it is their fault they can't go up the stairs. While in actuality, it is the flaw in the design of the building. The building is a metaphor for how our society is set up. It is set up to push for the success of a certain type of person while leaving the rest to work twice as hard and advocate twice as much to get their voices heard. And this will not change unless we start a conversation about it. Unless the general public understands the inherent deep-rooted inequalities that exist and allies with neurodiverse communities and other discriminated populations to push for appropriate change. Ableism doesn't just affect neurodivergent people, it affects anyone with any diverse needs. Now let me clarify something before we move on because it is immensely important. 
I keep saying neurodiverse as if it's this one big umbrella and everyone who's neurodivergent is the same. That cannot be further from the truth. Every single neurodivergent person has a diff different struggles, different stretches, different strengths, different interests, different learning history, just like anyone else. And because of that, this whole creating conversation around neurodiversity that I'm pushing for here needs to be led by neurodivergent people. There are many, many, many wonderful self-advocates out there with different forms of neurodiversity and therefore different experiences. Their voices need to be heard and the conversation needs to be led by them. And as someone who is neurodivergent, I am here because I wanna advocate for this conversation. Now, in my opinion, the best way to create lasting change is through the education system. Our education system is shifting massively and making valiant efforts to move towards true inclusive classroom models and individualized education plans for every student with diverse needs. Our teachers are doing the absolute best that they can given the system that they operate within. However, something I see over and over again when I go to certain schools as an educator is that the system does not believe in the true potential of students with exceptionalities. What I mean by that is, if a student does not learn based on how the teacher is teaching the entire classroom, it's just assumed that that student cannot learn that topic. I usually see this especially in STEM. Many times I see that certain people in the education system lower their expectations when it comes to students with diverse learning needs. This is extremely ableistic, not to mention dangerous, because when you lower your expectation for a certain person, they will obviously not be able to show you their, the full strength of their potentials. It is not until we presume potential in all students, independent of diagnosis or diverse learning needs, that we create a learning environment that is truly inclusive. Again, it is not the responsibility of the student to fit themselves in the classroom and the activities and advocate for themselves in the education system. The education system needs to change and truly appreciate the potential of every student and needs to train teachers on techniques that can help include all students in their classroom and help harness the potential. Not doing this is why there's such high dropout rates out of educational institutions. This is why some students like myself spend years thinking that we're not smart enough or capable enough instead of appreciating that we just learn different and that is okay. Most people learn different. The education system needs to provide the resources and training necessary to support diverse learners. Now let's take a detour and talk about something else. And if you know me personally, you know that that's just how I talk and tell stories in general. So I spent most of my educational life wondering why I never fit into the mold of the education system. I just couldn't learn and, and test well in certain classes and with certain testing techniques, even though I knew the material probably better than most of my classmates. Now, when I got to university, I decided to go into computer science. I remember when I was choosing this major, people were like, girl, why are you going into computer science? It is so male dominated. You will have to explain your existence to everyone and you will have to be so loud just to get heard in the industry. And whenever I heard that, I would think, that's, that is so old fashioned. Tech has changed now. I actually have female classmates now, woohoo. And that nice idealistic view um, existed for a while until um, it came trembling down in second year uh, when a male classmate of mine decided to make small talk with me after class. And it went a little like this. Hi, nice to meet you. I'm Alex. Which I replied, hi Alex, I'm Bahar. How are you enjoying the class? Yeah, this class is tough to be honest. Speaking of which, uh, why are you taking it? Oh, it's part of my major actually, I replied. Oh cool, what's your major? He said, computer science, I replied. Oh, really? Uh, you don't look like you would be in computer science. Later that day, I'm sitting with my friends in our student union building, and I'm telling them about the sky and about how frustrated I was about this conversation. We started talking about how there's this viewpoint that a certain kind of person belongs in a certain kind of industry doing certain kinds of tasks. We talked about how many industries seriously need to um, 
make an effort to become more inclusive and incorporate diverse perspectives and mindsets. I talked about how I had a hard time going through the education system and um, why I felt like I didn't fit the mold of a typical gardener. My friends mentioned how she had the same struggle and she also saw, saw it in her family members. We started looking online to see if we could find boot camps and classes that would help to design neurodivergent people find passion in certain industries. And we came up with very little, if anything, for the tech industry. And being the female leaders that we were, we decided to create an organization. So in 2017, in our second year of undergraduate degrees, we created a nonprofit in Canada called the Code Initiative, with the aim of introducing neurodivergent students to the world of tech and coding, a field which are grossly left out of. To create code, we consulted with many different professionals in the field, as well as many neurodivergent individuals themselves, to see how we can support them best and also how to teach using a strength-based method. We wanted to provide accessible learning and create ramps and elevators for the building that I was mentioning previously that had no stairs. Everyone deserves to have access to quality and accessible education that was designed with their strengths and needs in mind. Everyone deserves to get to the top floor of that building. So with all of that in mind, we developed a series of curricula and hosted our first workshop in June of 2017 with our own money and the money we had fundraised from selling donuts in front of the Canada Line SkyTrain station, which in hindsight apparently is not allowed without a permit, so I really recommend people check that out before they do this. It was an extremely exciting feeling walking into our first workshop, but it was kind of terrifying because there was very little, if anything, out there for us to build off of. We didn't know what to expect. But after the first day, all that we could feel was awe. We were in awe of the potential that our students had and how incredibly smart and capable they were. You know, learning in progress comes in different forms for different people. We have had students who come into our classes without knowing how to use a computer or having the fine motor skills to do so and are not familiar with coding platforms such as Scratch. We have had students who cannot yet use a computer for whatever reason still learn the concepts of coding through activities that was designed specifically for them. We have taught coding using physical Lego blocks that we could put on top of each other and go through the command chains, using dance, using art, and even using music. We also have students who've come into our classes with a basic level of coding, but walked out with very in-depth knowledge of certain languages. I remember we had this one student, and I will always remember this, because uh, there's five classes that he had to come to, and he went through the materials of this language called Python so fast that we had to create another curriculum just so we could learn more. We've had students who've gone so empowered through our system that they decided to pursue post-secondary education in fields relating to technology. Now, the point of the code initiative isn't to turn every neurodivergent student into a master coder and have them go and pursue a career in tech. Some will do and some will not, and that is totally fine. The point is to give opportunities to all students and allow them to explore a field that they might find passion in. Our goal is to give successes, even if it means many successes. Through making their own games or successfully debugging your code, because these successes are what empowers students and proves to them that they are smart and capable. As I've worked at CODE, I met many amazing individuals who came forth with their stories, individuals with autism, ADHD, dyslexia, and so on and so forth, and said to us that against all odds, they made it. And how happy they were that we were giving uh, students this opportunity from an early age and introducing them to uh, the tech world. And as heartwarming as inspirational those stories are, going against all odds to have basic rights to quality and equal educational opportunities reflects really poorly on our educational system and society as a whole. I'm immensely proud of the work my organization has done in the past years. I'm immensely grateful that we've had the opportunity to work with about 400 neurodivergent students. However, there needs to be much more done to systematically change the inequalities that exist in our society. There needs to be policy changes, additional funding, 
campaigns to raise awareness for the public, all of which needs to be done with neurodiverse communities leading the way. Representation matters, including all voices, especially those that are most affected by the situation, matters. Having neurodivergent individuals lead this conversation and have equal voices on such issues matters. We need to build those ramps, those elevators, or better yet, we need to rebuild the entire building from the ground up with the input and say of neurodiverse communities. Because there is no way policies will be effective, decisions will be impactful, or any true change will come if voices of neurodiverse communities are not heard, valued, and respected. My name is Bahar Musavi, and thank you so much for listening to my talk.